How do you persuade someone to stop bombing civilian areas, not to recruit children as soldiers, or that they shouldn't raid villages to pillage the only food supply? There has never been a greater need for effective advocacy for the protection of civilians in conflict and crisis. But how do we do this protection advocacy? What skills and techniques can we use? How can we identify decision makers? What tactics work? And how can we manage risks? Welcome to the Advocating for Protection podcast, where we bring you the real experiences of advocates in conflict and crisis. In each episode, you'll hear from those who are lobbying in the corridors of the UN buildings in New York, those who are face to face with armed actors at the front line of conflict zones and everything in between. They will tell us about their personal experiences, their successes, but also the challenges and how they overcame them. This podcast comes to you from the Global Protection Clusters Advocacy Working Group. Please be aware that it contains discussions of violence, abuse and exploitation faced by civilians in conflict and crisis. Good afternoon, good morning. Um, this is the Advocacy for Protection podcast, real stories and experiences of humanitarians who advocate for the protection of civilians. My name is Vittorio Infante, and I'm here representing Oxfam, who, uh, together with Save the Children, is co-leading the advocacy working group at the Global Protection Cluster. Today, I'm joined by our guest, Gemma Davis, from the ODI Humanitarian Policy Group. Hi, Gemma. Hi, Vittorio. Nice to be here. Thanks for joining us today. Before we delve into the topic of today's discussion, Gemma, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more on how you got involved in protection advocacy. So I have been in the humanitarian sector for around 18 years now. First started with uh, Medicine Sans Frontier on the operational side of things. As you might know, MSF have termonage, which is speaking out or bearing witness as a central part of their identity. So I guess from the very outset, even though I was in more operational management positions, it was sort of part of the culture of the organisation that we would bear witness. And indeed, if we were needing to bear witness and advocate on the behalf of the people that we were working with, uh, that we would do so. I guess since then, um, you know, sort of my career sort of developed into doing more on the advocacy agenda, as you said, working on um, on policy, so directly involved in advocacy. And so when I joined the Humanitarian Policy Group, um, part of ODI, there was already a project on the role of advocacy to strengthen the protection of civilians. And obviously, this is quite central to the experience that I had. So we're now sort of three years plus of doing this experience of looking at a wide range of of humanitarian actors and what the role is of advocacy. And obviously, I could bring uh, quite a lot of my own background and experience into that. Fantastic. And, and, and that's very good to know as well, Gemma, that throughout your career, I guess you also have witnessed somehow protection advocates methodology and ways of working change. I mean, in 18 years, different geopolitical contexts, different ways in which humanitarian leverage has been built by different organizations, whether at the CSO level or more at the global level. So Gemma last year authored a report called Complementary Approaches Between International and Local Protection Advocacy. Don't speak for me, I'll speak for myself. This is a powerful analysis of how protection advocacy often is the result of combined efforts and coalition between national protection actors, international humanitarian organizations and civil society actors. How, how do you think, you know, now looking back on the sort of advocacy that you've seen taking place, how do you think we're faring as protection advocates? That's a really good question. I think there was a certain point of time where it became a lot more prominent to carry out advocacy in attempting to strengthen protection. You know, we were in the 90s off the back of two genocides, Rwanda, uh, the former Yugoslavia. We then came out of the Sri Lanka conflict and there was the high levels of criticism that the humanitarian sector were more or less silent and did not live up to their obligations to defend the rights of conflict-affected civilians. During that, there was Darfur, where advocacy became quite prominent. So I think there was sort of a, over a few years, a bit of an awakening as to the need. You know, the advocacy is a core component of, of humanitarian action, and that we've sort of committed to promote the protection of conflict-affected civilians. I think since then, 
I actually think that we've seen, uh, quite sadly, a demise in that. You know, the humanitarian sector at large has become really quite risk averse. It's become very projectized. And, and in many ways, there's been investments in capacities around coordination, et cetera, et cetera. That's, I hope, promising. But I think the overall trajectory has, um, unfortunately, it, it seems to have gone a little bit backwards. Um, let's hope that these renewed conversations that are happening at the moment and some of the evidence that we're bringing in the conversations that we're having with the Global Protection Cluster and others can reignite some of those conversations. But, but to me, I think one of the central ideas that was uh, in, in several of your reports at HPG that really resonated with me is about, you know, this tension that we used to see humanitarian advocacy on uh, protection of civilians as being a little bit of a top-down exercise, whilst, as you highlight, a lot of the conversations around humanitarian reform, they bring up, you know, that human element. So the capacity and voices and agency and power of, you know, the communities that we work with? I think there's growing recognition of the added value and the critical role that local actors, that survivors, that civil society organisations can and should play. And, and obviously, there's been a lot of conversation over, over the years around sort of the power dynamics of the humanitarian system. But I think what is being spoken in the policy domain is still pretty far from what we see um unfortunately at the at the operational level and you know in situations where people are affected by crisis and conflict i think the power differentials too often uh remain i think where there are opportunities to redress this and rebalance this it's often based on individuals rather than a sort of institutional and and system wide redress but saying that we're seeing we are seeing examples of positive change and i think we've seen some really impressive advocacy um often not formalized so one of the examples that we uh, looked at in south sudan was the role of survivors civil society working with international humanitarian actors as well as diplomatic actors development actors, et cetera, to develop accountability, well, recognition first off and second of all, accountability to the horrific levels of gender-based violence in South Sudan. One of our interviewees, who is both a survivor and a civil society representative, saying that actually the role of the international community should not be to represent the voices of survivors and those affected by conflict. It should be to provide a platform. And too often, though there is growing practice of this, again, it's not, it's not systematic, it's not, it's not standard practice as of yet. That's excellent, Gemma. And you offered so many points for reflection there. I think if you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, how do we go from something that's completely, say, spontaneous, or, you know, where the overlap between interests is so what would be one tip, you know, for any protection advocate, whether at the grassroots level or at the regional level or at the global level, on how you bring about people with the same set of values, but maybe slightly differing interests? I think organizations and the structures, the humanitarian structures they work within need to get beyond mandate and they need to go beyond their organizational interest. You have to get to a point where you agree on what is the area that we're all trying to influence? And use that as your starting point. What change do you want to achieve? And what do we each contribute to that? I remember speaking to one interviewee and that person said to me, just get away all the branding, get away all of the mandates, and then we might work more effectively together. Some of it will be reactive. You might not always know where you're going with your advocacy objective, but you're moving towards something. So in the situation I just, uh, I just referenced, it was... And this sort of growing sort of set of organizations and individuals that recognize those horrifying levels of, of gender-based violence and wanted to bring visibility to the issue, wanted more accountability of the issue, and wanted that survivors were brought into that conversation. And varying different sets of actors sort of had a role um, in that. Was that branded towards, uh, you know, a certain cluster, a certain organisational identity? No, it was, it was actually sort of 
really working much more beyond that. And I think, I mean, uh, hearing you speak about that, that sort of um, collective effort, you know, unbranded, going a little bit beyond each agency's mandate, two things that sprang to my mind are, one, the example of uh, collaborative advocacy between different agencies under the banner of crisis action, which is, I think, somehow also reflected in your report that we were quoting earlier. But then also some of the uh, work that the GPC, the Global Protection Cluster itself, has been doing, I think, over the past couple of years as well, picking up on, on certain situations of concerns where you had, I don't know, like in Afghanistan, very restrictive operational environment. And, and through the Global Protection Cluster, agencies were able to gather their thoughts, you know, around one or two key demands towards mm. uh, the de facto authorities and, and potentially push forward a more rights-based protection um, agenda. Can you maybe expand a little bit upon that? You know, how are these coalitions perceived uh, by, say, host government authorities or power holders more generally? I think it depends on the coalition and it depends on the issue. I think, though, the main thing, as you said, in in every sort of advocacy initiative, there has to be thought as to who has legitimacy, who has credibility, and how those advocacy positions are then framed. Often in the humanitarian sector, it is international actors leading, and international, let's face it, are perceived as global north or western actors They're often framed in international frameworks, referencing international humanitarian human rights law, refugee law, whichever body of law is most relevant, but often disconnected from both the context and towards the target. And those, these days, they fall on flat ears, frankly. I mean, I think in everything you have to think of, as we said, who has credibility, legitimacy, Understanding that, as you referenced before, in the in the geopolitical environment, the global north and the west is increasingly less less perceived as legitimate actors. So there must be consideration and intentional consideration around the diversity of actors that are representing those voices. Secondly, I think it's who is that advocacy message targeted at? What are their interests, and, and where are you going to have leverage with them? So um, you know, and where's there going to be acceptance and At times, national actors have greater credibility, greater acceptance and greater understanding of how to influence national advocacy targets than international actors. And I'll give an example. Following the influx and humanitarian response of Syrian refugees into into Jordan back in 2015, Jordanian national actors highlighted how the international humanitarian community came in with those standardised messages, you know, of upholding X, Y, Z law and said that the international humanitarian community's over-reliance on those standard generalised approaches had a negative impact and and rebukes from the Jordanian government and, and a real risk of closing down dialogue. And then, you know, through the years, there was growing collaboration between national and international organisations and national organisations really then worked with international organisations on how to frame those messages grounded in Jordanian culture, in language the Jordanian government uh, would have traction with the Jordanian government. And equally, when you're trying to, you know, change behaviours of communities, for example, and and then started to see progress on that. Um, so one sort of win that they had when advocacy positions were framed in a culturally and context relevant way was progression on, for example, refugees access to work. So quite strong evidence there of, you know, when grounded and work when working strategically in collaboration, what can be achieved. I wonder to what extent, you know, is the humanitarian system still thinking, for example, local actors are great to lead on an operational point of view from an operational point of view, whilst, you know, for the advocacy, there's still this uh, doubt or misconception around neutrality, impartiality, independence. And I think we've seen a lot of that coming to the fore with regards to the conversation in Ukraine. But I wondered, yeah, what, what you thought about that? Yeah, I think it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think, first of all, as you say, part of the problem of the humanitarian system is that national actors are still seen as downstream partners to an extent. Generally, practices are still extractive. And and of course, there are a few different conversations. On the one side, you hear conversations around whether national actors can and do uphold principles and some of the risks involved in involving them with that. 
on the other side, we sometimes see this almost paternalistic approach of let's not involve national actors in advocacy, at least uh, at the forefront, in case of risks. With either end of that spectrum, it's a little overly simplistic. The biggest part for me in that is that these need to be broken down and they need to be broken down while working in an open dialogue and communication with our sort of national regional counterparts. Too often these these perceptions of, oh, um, it might breach neutrality because, you know, if you're talking to civil society or rights-based groups, they're more on the political side. Well, I think, frankly, the humanitarian community needs to challenge itself as to how neutral the international humanitarian community are. Quite often, the international humanitarian community itself has lost a lot of legitimacy in how neutral they are. So let's also be aware of perceptions on ourselves. I think also one thing we we seem to forget as the humanitarian community is what survivors are asking from us. Sometimes humanitarian actors take a more reserved position or even a silent position. But we've got to remember that silence in the face of atrocities is a position. And that also can lead to some perceptions that the international community can be complicit in abuses. That's what's just happened in Myanmar. It's what happened in Sri Lanka back in 2009. So I think we have to really reckon on how neutral we are. I think also we need to remember that neutrality is a tool but also the objective of humanitarian action is humanity. And if survivors are asking us to stand with them, then maybe that's what we need to do. Mm-hmm. I think from from my side, when, when you talk about the kind of requests and, and, and support that INGOs can give to survivors of atrocity crimes or human rights violations on a large scale, that's for sure the, the advocacy and, and the kind of agenda setting that we could have in, in certain markets as you as as you want to call them it is actually something quite important because we have access to say i don't know the media we have access to donors diplomatic actors uh whether it's multilaterals or influential governments bilaterally the question to me is how can we rebalance you know how can we make sure that this kind of top down dynamic that we usually have been operating for decades can be rebalanced how can we build that there needs to be effective collaboration requires trust, it requires open dialogue, and it requires partnerships that go beyond programs. You know, when dealing around issues of advocacy, it can't only be based on partnerships through programs. It has to be a much longer term and policy-oriented discussion. You know, I think recognising as well that there is naturally power imbalance in the system is is asking INGOs and international actors, we, we have to be humble, we have to listen more, and we have to have that open dialogue. Another um, interview he said to us through the course of this research that, you know, trust can take years to build and seconds to destroy, which is so true. And I'm sure we've all got experiences within that. So I think it's, you know, making sure that that dialogue is there, it's taken out of this sort of power imbalance approach, and then working on that sort of really a partnership level on what is it we're trying to achieve? What platforms do we have open to us? What are the most effective ways to make change? And then, you know, coming back to that conversation around around risk, what is the risk? How can we collectively mitigate it? Where you do have collaborations between national and international actors, that in itself can mitigate risk because, you know, you have a range of, of, of actors working towards one advocacy objective or a range of objectives. So I think it's redressing some of that and then ensuring that decision making is based on that. It sounds simple and straightforward, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of humanitarian organisations and certainly the system is not there yet. I couldn't agree with you more in terms of how the system is not really built for that type of consensual collaborative decision making because more often than not these things depend on I don't know political will and the CSO strength so I I don't know if this is something that you have thought about uh, whilst you were doing your research. I think every advocacy agenda has to be based on what is it you're trying to achieve what's the context you're trying to achieve it in and what are the opportunities open to you you know so it's got to be based a little bit on the dynamics that you're finding yourself in. You've got to be working a bit with the momentum that there is. You need to create momentum where it doesn't exist. But I think, as you say, I think international organizations and INGOs 
need to recognize that they need to give up space. They need to move beyond their own agenda. And as you say, sort of outside of this um, projectized approach, I think increasingly, if we're really wanting to make change, we, as we being the international humanitarian community, need to perceive ourselves as playing a facilitation role. That can be allowing local organizations, survivors, facilitating access to international platforms. It can be Also, things that seem quite simple, but really are quite complex, such as working around navigating the complex structures at regional mechanisms, such as the AU, at the Security Council, etc. These are very complex spaces. They're places where it's national organizations and survivors, civil society might not have had exposure to before. So it's really sort of giving that role a little bit more. But I think it then really has to be based on the circumstance, the situation, as you say, sort of what is going on, what can every actor involved in this from survivor to national to international actor bring? What are the opportunities? What are the risks? And then sort of really working in in a truly collaborative, but also iterative way, you know. But just to say, you know, I can't emphasize enough how much I think international actors just really have to consider their role as giving a platform and facilitating. And, you know, when we say capacity building, it's not that. It's more sort of working with organisations and with individuals on how to navigate these incredibly complex regional and international mechanisms where you may be able to affect change. That's excellent to hear in terms of also how a renewed role for, for an NGO could look like. I think, again, there's been no shortage in policy papers and, you know, donors initiative around humanitarian system reform. But I think what you're suggesting, Gemma, brings it down to the nitty gritty and, and some real concrete operational asks that we could implement mm. within each agency. And um, going back to what you were saying as well, or one of the advantages for the collaboration between uh, different humanitarian stakeholders. Risk management, I think, is one that has drawn our attention quite a lot of late. Uh, I think we're a little bit on the back foot as humanitarians on how to collaborate, say, with civil society activists when they face backlash. But I, I, I wondered if you also had any insights on how risk is being managed at the moment. What could we do to make sure that when someone speaks up to raise the issue of protection of civilians and and the rights of civilians in conflict, they're not facing unmanageable, unintended consequences. So I think it's a a really important point. As I said before, we, we face this dichotomy where either national actors or survivors can be you know, the risks are are not being adequately assessed, even though they often face much more risks and far fewer options to manage them than the international actors or this paternalistic role that international actors sometimes play in saying, okay, let's not put national actors at risk, so let's exclude them from a process. But again, this is where collaborations can be highly effective. So, for example, there was another situation also in South Sudan, but different to the sort of GBV situation, where a range of international and national actors were working together, including international humanitarian, human rights and national civil society collaborated. So then when human rights actors are much better equipped by the nature of their work, at hu- working with human rights defenders and then, you know, trying to help them manage risks as and when they play out, including through trying to get them to a safer area out of the country if that's necessary. And so we did see the situation in South Sudan play out. And by nature of that sort of informal coalition, it meant that there was some support that could be given for the national civil society actor and the individuals that were then targeted. Can we anticipate this so that if and when these risks do play out, they can be acted on because often they can escalate quite quickly. So you need to be prepared and ready to respond. But again, I think all of this speaks to the necessity of working in coalitions and with a range of actors beyond the humanitarian community. Yeah, and I think unpacking a little bit that point in terms of how you build bridges, for example, with human rights actor, somehow human rights defenders, even uh, when it comes to, I don't know, information, security management, they seem to be a little bit more proactive, whilst for humanitarians, the understanding of risk is 
often, you know, very much dictated by the context and reactive. So thinking, going to operate in such and such environment, so I will sort of future-proof my operations in a certain way. Whilst I think deliberately human rights defenders sometimes think a bit more carefully on ways in which information could be transmitted. They look also at the politics behind it. I don't know what could be done to make sure that different humanitarians consult and collaborate with their human rights counterpart. But I also know that this is another topic um, that you have explored extensively throughout uh, your time at HPG and also before. But I think sometimes I am left wondering whether we can learn something from, I don't know, organizations that deal with information security like tactical tech and others who do, for instance, training to human rights defenders on how to save information. How do you build bridges with other experts um, in those kind of realms? Sometimes this maybe should be the role of the UN country teams on making sure that those dynamics happen. But I think more often than not, it's down to INGOs and CSOs activists, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, look, there's always been, there's been this long-standing discussion on the extent to which humanitarian and human rights actors should and could collaborate and the barriers going back into these issues around principles predominantly and the fear of retaliation. And we know that the fear of risks associated in carrying out advocacy is a major barrier for organisations and humanitarian organisations to more strategically use advocacy as a tool to strengthen protection. But When a situation escalates, particularly from a security perspective, the first thing that closes down from humanitarian actors, international humanitarian actors specifically, is a deprioritization of protection, a deprioritization of raising protection risks, i.e. advocacy in any and all forms. But I would argue that that's exactly the point that you need collaboration with human rights actors. It doesn't need to be visible. A lot of what we do is behind closed doors. But it's exactly then that you should be looking at where do we have leverage and where can we collectively push? Because in these situations, human rights actors can and they're prepared to say more. They will only do so with evidence, which, by the way, most humanitarian actors cannot give them. They will always have to go and verify. But they can do more about this. So when humanitarian actors feel they can't, there's a space for them to fill. So I think we've really got to be a lot more strategic, a lot more cognizant and frankly, a lot less reactive. The reactive and go-to point seems to be close it down, do not collaborate. We've got to think a lot more strategically about this. And again, always bring it back to what do effective people need from us? I could bring an example if you wanted to. I personally would love to hear this one example. You know, as we know in Tigray, when, you know, the violence escalated there and Obviously, that situation in terms of the human rights and humanitarian violations escalated dramatically and the levels of abuses were huge. I spoke to a human rights actor who was there just after the escalation of Tigray, who said that trying to have any information sharing from humanitarians was, first of all, very, very difficult. We know this between human rights and humanitarian actors, as as I say, particularly where humanitarian actors feel like there could be retaliation. Or, or their position could be jeopardized or their operations could be jeopardized. But second of all, the information that they were given was actually quite a lot perception based rather than evidence based. That person and that organization felt strongly that if they were to bring out the evidence and work a lot more collaboratively and a lot quicker, they could have done a lot more in terms of advocacy rather than waiting until there was retaliation on the humanitarian community, by which time the leverage of the international community was perceived to have minimized rather than doing this at the height. So I think, again, thinking around when could we have leverage, which is the comparative advantage of each of our organization, and how do we all work towards an objective of trying to strengthen the protection of civilians, right? I think always keeping that in our mind. Indeed. And, and, and I think if I'm taking something out of this conversation, in addition to all the sort of suggestions that you've done and given to INGOs on how to be more equitable in their partnership, more humble as well on how we navigate some of the protection advocacy spaces, it's actually that around, you know, thinking in clear terms what the comparative advantage of each protection actor is how to use the information and when and where the pressure points are. So I think this example that you just gave, Gemma, encapsulates that very neatly. And and the final question for me, if we may, is about looking a little bit at how protection advocacy sometimes is challenging. It's it's a very slow 
track. Sometimes you go one step forward and two steps backwards. What would you say is something that uh, motivates you to keep going? What gives you hope for the future in, in carrying out this important and crucial work? Thanks. And I think this is too often the issue, isn't it? I think, first of all, as you say, sort of to change in the face of sort of such intractable, difficult, complex issues will never happen overnight. So there's a need for us to be persistent as an international humanitarian community collaborating with others. We need to take the long view. It needs multi-year engagement build the evidence base, but sustain investments. And I think this is also too often where humanitarian organizations fall short with our short-term program cycles. But really, if we want to create change, we have to take that long view and we have to keep trying. But I think also adaptability to flex approaches according to external events, according to external moments, continue persisting in the face of obstacles. But I think also being realistic of the change that you're trying to be make be prepared for setbacks, believing that change is possible, and then celebrating with small wins. I think just always keeping that in front of you. And often that can be support from leadership, but often you can also achieve that by working in collaboration and in coalitions. And even if that is that one small step forward, that one small step forward can often mean a much greater leap further down the road. Those are very, very encouraging words, Gemma, and thanks for sharing them with us. I'm sure a lot of our listeners engaged with protection advocacy will agree with you. And I certainly agree with you on that front in particular, because often um, when we're looking at advocacy strategies, one approach that some of my colleagues and I are trying to go for is not looking at, you know, very ambitious and bold objectives that uh, would take us, I don't know, three years to achieve, but trying to break it down into smaller steps that would ultimately contribute to the greater good. So, so that resonates quite a lot with our experience, both at Oxfam and at the Global Protection Cluster Advocacy Working Group. I think we wrap up the first episode of our podcast now. Thanks again, Gemma, for sharing your insights and, and your expertise on, on such a sensitive and, and fascinating topic such as protection advocacy and multi-stakeholder collaboration we look forward to having you back on the podcast thank you very much great thanks for thank you for listening to this episode of the advocating for protection podcast it's produced by the global protection clusters advocacy working group which is co-led by save the children in oxfam and includes members from national and international ngos and un agencies you can find out more information about the Advocacy Working Group on globalprotectioncluster.org. Look out for the Protection Advocacy Toolkit whilst on this website. And if you have feedback or suggestions for future episodes, email us at protectionteam at oxfam.org.